Welcome to the Startup Grind. So where have you just come from? Fresh air, fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks, Changwen, for joining us today. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll start with, um, can you run us through a founder's journey? Um, you've done things in corporate finance, into fashion. Um, I love your sort of subtitles on your oh. LinkedIn profile from janitor to, you know, anything sort of goes. So yeah, run us through your journey up until now. Yeah, no, but that was true. So I think on, on my LinkedIn profile, my job description is quite simple. I think it encapsulates the things I really do at work. Not what I like to tell my friends about, but what I really do. So when I was in IBD, to be honest, you dealt with comms and financial models every day. The majority of my time was spent copying and pasting. So that was my job description. When I was in trading, uh, what was my job description? I think it was like cooking or career or some shit. And then the reason for that was because as junior traders, I mean, we do have books to trade, but a lot of our job, you know, to be fair, the most memorable thing I remember of that job was the fact that I had to buy breakfast and lunch every day. And of course, that, that became a job description, right? Because if I look back, you know, that's what I care the most about, what, what I remember about the job, what's unique. It's something you don't find on a normal job site, which tells you what a trader does, because that just looks nice. But what you really take away from that was the fact that I had to buy lunch and breakfast. And interestingly, <clears throat> Because I always had to buy lunch and breakfast, I got pretty sad. No, not exactly sad. It was nice. They bought me free meals, which is that I had to buy it. So I kind of started up something with my friend, which was a delivery service for food. I know Food Panda exists, but my bosses loved hawker food, and you know, Food Panda just doesn't cater to that. So I told him, look, I have a huge captive market for you. Why don't you start this business not with me? I'll feed you all the orders. So I told all my brokers and all the other bank traders, look, through order this platform, right? It's great food. So I earned a bit of extra money on the side, and I never had to step up for food again. But of course, after I stopped being a trader, um, I, yeah, it didn't really work out. So food delivery is hard, so that's it. And then after that, you started Marcella? So Marcella was something I had all along in college. I mean, to be fair, I think a lot of business ideas which I started actually started from a need. So I'm not sure if this is the best advice out there, starting from a need, because you can see out of three companies, only one company exists today. So maybe starting a company from just a need basis may not be the best idea. So Marcelo was started in college, poor student, fat student, no clothes student. So when you put these three together, what do you have? You have, oh, I need to tailor some damn thing for myself just to cover myself so I can appear at a job interview. And then, you know, I need to tailor. But fuck, tailors are so expensive, they are ripping me off. But I can't just buy a shirt from anywhere else because either the sleeves don't fit or the tummy doesn't fit. I know, at that time I was 10 kilos lighter, so it's just, I just want to look better. And then you reach a certain point in your age where you don't care anymore. Coming soon, coming soon. So we started Marcella. Um, the idea for Marcella was really affordable clothing which fit. And we thought that we could go do a very deep dive in the supply chain. So spent almost half a year to a year in China. Uh, this is a very interesting time, being stuck in China. And which year was this? I think, so half a year was in 2011, so I took half a year off school. Then we built up the first factory, then I went back to Barclays, was a trader for a year. Missed the days when I was extremely poor and had to eat 50 cents noodles by the roadside, but I realized that having more money doesn't even make you happier. I just wanted to experience life again, so that made me decide to leave, which most of my friends thought was crazy to do so. Went back to Marcella, spent another half a year, this time in Guangzhou, so we relocated our factory. It was really exciting times. Too many details there. And, you know, the business grew. But I think one thing just really lacking in that business, which I think on hindsight, I should have noticed, was the fact that to me, clothes were always meant to cover your body and nothing very much else. And I think when you have that mentality about the business you are running, it's very hard to really let the business succeed when you have no true, I wouldn't say passion for the business. The passion was for the wrong thing. The passion was for supply chain. But I think in due time, we realized that for the business to succeed, the passion needed to be in something you're selling to your consumers. Consumers, we realized, didn't care that much about price. They cared about branding. You know, they like to wear clothes and feel good. You know, most of my clothes are from Uniqlo because I feel very happy that my wallet's still not empty after I have these clothes on. 
and it feels good. But you know, that, I think that was really lacking the fact that you know, in the kind of custom apparel market, you really needed to make customers feel happy that they pay a premium. But we, we just didn't get it, right? So I think it didn't. It picked up. It was decent. And then when we moved into e-commerce, we saw a need for logistics. Um, at that point in time, I think we were a bit frustrated using Sing Post. I mean, the very core tenets of e-commerce are variety, and I guess transparency and immediacy, which a lot of logistics companies kind of neglected. It's still very much in the old school days. I think from there, we were like, you know, why don't we start something? Like, let's have a van and deliver some goods. I'm sure you can fix, solve the algorithms and the supply chain problems, because that's what we actually like the most. Most of us came from algorithmic or mathematical backgrounds. So it was like, let's do it. Just toying with that idea for a bit. And I think I went for dinner with my friends once, and they say, no, look, why don't you do it? We, we think you can do it. Just go figure it out. And I was like, uh, are you sure? They're like, okay, let's give you a couple hundred thousand. <clears throat> Just, just go do it, right? No plan, nothing. Good luck. And yeah, we accepted the money and we figured our way out. In the earlier days of Ninja Van, I think we were like toying the idea, okay, let's do a bit of deliveries and logistics is a simple space, you know, building up some simple algorithms and a system. And in six months, we'll be done and you know, we'll build payments and then we'll build Shopify and we'll build all these things for a whole ecosystem. And that was probably the most wishful thinking of my life. I still remember the nights we spent with our CTO discussing how we would finish logistics in six months and move to payments. It's been two years and we're still mired and dipshit. We're still building things every day, day in, day out. Nowhere close to solving logistics at all. So how has your um, product roadmap really changed from the very beginning? Like, um, did you have a completely different product solution that you had expected to build? I think the vision still remain rather similar. Get a parcel in the hands of consumers anywhere, anytime in the most efficient manner possible. But I think the journey towards that became a lot longer than we ever expected. We saw a lot more about the market, went a lot deeper, went a lot broader, and realized that there's just so many areas we needed to improve. And I think the sad thing is as the company scales, become less nimble, things move a bit slower. When the ship leaves the harbor, it's much harder to get it back to the harbor. So you think a lot more carefully before you say, let's go do this. And it's just a whole new experience altogether again, really. And in terms of the team, the initial team that you had, did you bring on friends from the previous business as well? Yes, I think all, all the guys in the previous business came along. And I think we hired a ton of friends. All, most of them from my secondary school days. Um, this is a bit controversial, but I know you like that. How is it working with friends? Okay, so I think, interestingly, I think we read a lot of things about working with friends. So one thing they said, never work with friends. Another camp says, friends are the best to work with, right? So I think what I've experienced is for a company to scale, so if you want to build a five-man company, work with friends, I think that's fine. For a company to scale, we, so I'm, our hit count is probably four to 500 now. For a company to scale, you will not have 500 friends. If you do something wrong, it's your definition of friends. So if you want to have that many, you don't have that many friends, which means you need to hire people from the outside. And I think it's important for you to be very fair in how you treat everybody, regardless of whether they are friends or not. <clears throat> and the only way to do that is to be impartial. But then the problem of friends comes in, right? What do you do if it's a friend? And I realized that the best way to treat that is if you are a friend, it is my duty as a friend to give you every possible opportunity to succeed. But it's my duty as your boss to ensure that if you do not succeed, you have to go, or you are put in a position where you can succeed, but you may not be as lofty as the position you used to like. And I think we have seen that happen. The main reason is star performers are not star managers. You, know, you start off really well in a five-man setup. You know, you're great at doing it. But when it becomes 50, when it becomes 500, you realize that this person's role is not about executing anymore. It's about managing, it's about leading. And this person or this position is a lot more important if he's able to amplify his capabilities through his team. And you realize that out there, the best star performers are not necessarily the best star managers. And that's where, as a friend, I try my best to coach and coach and coach, teach. I, I teach myself too. I, get, I hope people teach me too. But sometimes it just doesn't work that way. And you know you have to have the hard conversations, which is, look, you're great at what you do, but your department now has 100 people. Okay, all these are hypothetical, eh? no names. <laughs> Right, uh, so, you know, your department is 100 people now, and you're not amplifying your team. You cannot lead your team like this. Three more months, try your best. As a friend, this is the opportunity, right? 
after three months pass, you still cannot do it, then what next? Okay, I found another position for you. <laughs> Move. And I think friendship goes both ways, from my side and from their side. If, and they understand where I'm coming from, as long as you're always principled and you stay true to what you say. So I guess that is generally how. No, no firm ideas here, just some experiences here. Yeah. Um, and going back to the business, how did you really achieve early traction? Luck and hustle. Never had a clear vision, never had a clear roadmap. The vision changes. Okay, the general vision stays the same. It just gets sharper every day. I mean, I will, I'll be lying if I said I knew exactly what we're going to be doing. I'll be lying if I said two years ago I knew that we'll be here. I think to start, you just hustle. You just be true to your word. I think that's how we got a lot of clients initially. When we promise something, do or die, we get it done. You know, even if it means not sleeping overnight, we make sure we get it done. I think that's the best way to keep people with you. So with your, who were your initial like first three clients? Marcella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Left pocket, right pocket, right? <laughs> uh, but that was a small client. A mm -hmm. small client. And I think after that, we, we had Charles and Keith and Love Bonito, and they gave us quite a good jumpstart in volumes. So, I mean, in that aspect, we're really lucky. Because I think this, this industry has a certain problem with scale. You need to tip a certain scale before you can actually grow a lot more. So we were lucky to really get these few clients initially. I mean, if you had to grow 10 parcels per day at each time, I mean, in a month, you only have 300, which is hard to scale. And then you stay at 300, and it's just, you just get nowhere. People start losing faith. Right? But you see a very quick traction up, and we're lucky because with a few big clients, we managed to swindle. And we, we grew it quite fast, and you know, everyone got very hyped up and pumped up. And you know, we were thinking, you know, let's do this for the next two years, and in two years, let's expand overseas. Surprisingly, in less than eight months, we're like, okay, let's go to Malaysia. Let's go to Malaysia. I was like, okay, okay, drive down. <clears throat> let's find a way. And it was like that, which we opened Malaysia, and which is now probably top five to ten in the country. And we're like, okay, this is tough now. You know, a lot of legal issues, a lot of operational issues, cultural issues. They're like, okay, enough, enough. Oh, let's stop for a while. And surprisingly, in three, four months later, Indonesia opened. We went there again, the same thing. Eyes wide shut, no clue what's happening. You go there and just find your way again. But you start realizing that there's a certain mechanism in this whole replicability of it all, that you don't want to train a person and send him out and train another one. You want to train one, who will then train two, who then train four, who then train eight. And this allows you to expand a lot faster. So. Um, and how have you been balancing, balancing profitability versus growth for you guys? So the question of profitability always lies far away in many startups to a certain extent. And Profitability, the biggest problem with profitability to me at least is when profitability comes when you expect a consumer behavior shift or to maintain a consumer behavior when something fundamental changes. It is one thing to say this is my scale and my unit comes are going down and you're very certain on that. I think that's fine. To me, that's a decent profitability. Okay, we are in some countries profitable, net, net, so that aside. But the way we look at profitability is, if I were to go into the market, and for example, I subsidize the market, and I'm not profitable, and I believe that in one year later, when I take away these subsidies, consumers are still keep coming back, and then I'll become profitable. To me, that's one of the biggest flaws out there, because you never know what's going to happen the moment you make a fundamental shift in consumer behavior or purchasing decision. So profitability in that aspect, I think, is very questionable. However, if I say that, now I have one van. It's unfortunately delivering one parcel a day. My cost for the van is $10, I'm collecting revenue of $5. Can one van realistically deliver three parcels a day? No, yeah, obviously, right? And then I'll get $15 and the van costs $10. It is profit. Are we at three yet? No, we're at one. But to me, I think that's a very clear path to profitability. Then the converse example applies, right? My van can theoretically do three parcels max and I am selling a parcel at $5, which means my revenue is $5 right, per parcel, for example. And, but yet, right now, my cost structure is... Okay, sorry, rewind. Okay, my van can do three parcels max a day. My cost is $10, which means I have to sell it at $3.33 to be break even. However, I now sell it at $2, but I'm confident that one day consumers will pay 5 The market is paying at 2 People are buying at two. 
I said, no, one day consumer behavior will change. When I remove my $1.33 subsidy to bring me a break even, or when I remove <clears throat> my $2 plus, I will be profitable. I think that's a very big question mark there because you never know what consumers will do when you remove that subsidy. You've been going to market in Vietnam, um, Indonesia, and Malaysia. What have what has your go to market strategy been like? You briefly mentioned that you pretty much just like chong to one country and see what happens, right? Um, but how long has that process been before you actually set an ops team on the ground? Um, like, what's the process of planting seeds and then setting up an, a local team? Can you tell us a bit more about your go to market strategies? Okay, so we do market analysis. So we don't believe that our product is always the best. I mean, to be honest, us delivering parcels, I'm sure there are enough of you here who have had a bad experience with Ninja Van. So we don't, I don't profess to have 100%. It's better than the competition, but that's not setting the bar very high. Right? It's, it's never going to be an absolute differentiator. And the biggest problem we have with most markets is when you go into a market, you know, you might be better at some things, but there's something which you always like, and there's coverage. You can't go into a market and say, I cover the entire Indonesia in two, one month. It takes you two years, potentially. And these two years, you're always inferior in that aspect. And what I realized to really succeed is to be the absolute best. So it is a lot. We were lucky to start in Singapore because we were the absolute best, or so I hope, in Singapore. But it, we are definitely not the absolute best in Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam. We don't have full country coverage. We might be better in every other aspect, but we just lack that component. So it became very important for us to go into every market and identify where the white spaces were, which are the kind of services we can be the absolute best in. Go in there, win the clients on that volume and slowly shift them into the more standardized volumes and build our coverage at the same time. And I think that's the first step of identification. The second would then be a very long, drawn legal process. Um, many times you ask yourself, how, of, how willing am I to sit in jail for a while in that country if this happens? And more often than not, answers, yeah, so be it. Experience, right? Sit in jail. No, never went on. Yeah, so. Legal took quite some time. Then you need to find people. Finding people is difficult. We don't like to compromise. And we always believe in a local first approach. So we don't like to parachute people in and say, you know, this is the head of the country, it's Singaporean. We trust him more, follow the Singaporean way or follow the correct way. It's always, we we'll wait till we find the correct local person and say, okay, you believe what's right. These are the few things we have learned. It's up to you to implement it. But if you don't implement it and the KPIs are not met, you are in trouble. Which doesn't mean that they will implement your SOPs. It just means that they're a lot more careful in thinking if the local way is the right way. And sometimes it may not be. Then you hire up your first ops teams, uh, you get your drivers, then some of us go down to the country and drive to learn, the, to learn how the ground is like. Then our algorithm, then we feed back a lot to our algorithms team and they keep upgrading our algorithms. The systems get localized. All in all, it takes about three to six months to open a country with a local head, operation teams on the ground. Yeah. And um, can you name some of the key um, relationships that have really sort of helped you with this process in each country? Key relationships? Yeah, or partners. Ourselves, sir. As in, so we get a lot of JV requests, but maybe I'm more on a stru company structuring background. Is, it's very difficult to do a lot of JVs out there because you cannot fold up the whole, whole code one day. If you want to IPO, if you want to get acquired, you know, whatever it is, it's extremely tricky when there's a lot of local code and whole code cap table disparities. So generally, we don't like doing that. And generally, people don't really help you if you don't JV with them. Mm -hmm. So you count on yourself. Mm -hmm. So I guess coming from inventory management and SaaS myself, um, I speak to a lot of e-commerce um, businesses. And um, typically the problem with last mile delivery 3PLs is um, customer service. They don't trust the last mile to deliver a service that they would themselves if they had their own um, fleets. How Can you share a bit about your philosophy within the company around um, customer centricity? So to us, customer service is very important. But there are two, to me, there's two components of customer service. The first is setting expectations right. The second is actually delivering on that service. I think try as we might, a lot of people may deliver a service which is better than the cost accorded to it, but many of them fail to manage the customer expectation, ourselves included. Right? I mean, you get a parcel. If it comes on time, yeah, it's meant to, right? If it doesn't come on time, you go and fuck the driver. 
<laughs> that normally happens. So maybe what makes us better is that our drivers get fucked a bit less, but nonetheless, it still gets coded. So yeah, customer expectation side is extremely important, but the biggest problem with customer expectation is that it works both ways. Is it us educating the consumer, or is it the e-commerce guy? And most times, e-commerce guys don't play ball. They promise things we should not be promised. They don't work with us to integrate the customer service properly. It becomes a very disparate process when the customer doesn't know who to contact us or the e-commerce company. But at this era, in, in perhaps the last two years, e-commerce has been gunning for growth. We tell them, let's integrate, let's integrate your order service so orders come in earlier. Let's integrate our webhook architecture back into your entire CRM so you can inform the customer on all the right milestones. They go, no, 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 no integration, no integration, CSV, CSV. Just, just dump you the orders, go get it delivered, right? Which doesn't help us help them. And try as you might, education is always difficult. Change management is close to impossible. When everyone's fighting for profitability and funding, these are normally the last things which e-commerce would think about. And then it doesn't help us manage customers' expectations. Then customers get angry. Then they get angry at us. Then we all get angry. And that's reality. First to win. Um, just a last question from me um, before I open it up to the audience. How have you been hiring senior level, uh, level management? That's a very difficult thing around this region. Uh, how, have you been sourcing talent from all around? How has that process been? To be honest, I think it's a lot harder hiring middle management than senior management. Because the really good people are available, and obviously they want to take senior management roles. So usually that's not much of a problem for us. It also helps that we have friends who are worthy of senior management roles. What's a lot harder is to hire middle management roles, because most people have an overinflated sense of self-worth. They think they are worth a lot more than they are. They're not self-aware. They need the experience. They need to learn but they don't think so. So they come in and say, no, I want to be one, you know, AVP, SVP, EVP, and they clearly have no capabilities to do so. Maybe in two years they could, but everyone wants to jump the ladder, right? Everyone thinks that a startup is where you go to to immediately skip the red race and go have a C level or something. And that's not true. And that's the only way a startup dies. When you fill up your senior ranks with people who do not deserve it, and, or, or you fill up your middle ranks with people who are meant for senior ranks, you oversell your middle ranks, and you realize that in half a year, in a year, they all want to rise because you've hired people who are too good for the job. And you have no place for them to go. You start creating stupid titles, chief of every damn thing, <laughs> which bloats up your org structure. Or, and then they leave their middle management roles and you have huge vacant roles everywhere, which you cannot fill because you've always sold the company on an overinflated sense of self-worth wherever you are. And then you run into very serious middle management problems. And I think Maybe to a certain extent, the whole startup culture is not exactly the right way to sell a job sometimes. It's always, you know, do anything you want, you know, do all this. And you realize you're just running around headless all the time, and everyone wants to rise, 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 rise. But if you go to MNC, you take 10 years to rise. Maybe a startup should take five, but not five months. But I think the mentality of many people is, you know, five months, I'm going to get somewhere much faster. I'm going to do this shit for three months, and I'll move on, and I'll move on, and move on. Then how do you create stability and growth and long-term visibility ahead? Sure. Um, so first question to the audience. Uh, hi. Um, I read that you recently got some funding. So what's your relationship like with your investors? Um, like, do you like hang out with them? Do you call them up? Like, do they help you out? Um, do they just give you money and run, or are they actually helping you um, grow the business? Like, what's that like? Love hate. No, no. So, to be fair, I think the more you raise, the later the rounds are, the more professional of sorts the relationship becomes. The seed round, good friends, and you know, like, bro, like your money, look, I'm gonna piss it away. You joke with him that, right? You try joking that with our B1 investor, you're stared, you're like, the fuck? <laughs> I have all my reserve matters inside, you can't do that, right? So it's still professional, they definitely help, and it's more what are the different types of investors you are in your company, which makes a difference. I mean, to me, I think there are a few, right? There are strategic guys who are corporate strategic and conglos, family businesses. There's financial PE. And there's VC who praise you become 100x, P who praise you become 10x but don't become zero. VCs who pray that you become 100x but uh, if you're zero, it's part of the game. And then you have financial companies who could help you a lot. Sorry, family conglomerates could help you a lot, but 
sometimes there are always strings attached. So it really depends. I think our relationship is good. We, we talk on WhatsApp, we chat about things, but there will come times when you, know, you need a board resolution passed and people have differing opinions and that's when you have to step in and you have to manage the board and I'm still learning how to do that every day. So with, with all the rounds that you've gone through, how many do you have in total and how did you find them? In, internal? How, in total, how, you, how many investors do you have in total? Oh, we had seat A and B. Oh, but how many investors, invest, like people? I mean, okay, organizations, we've had four. Yeah, we, we like to keep around smaller. So we don't like it when they're like 10 guys, like clamoring. It's normally harder to manage. So either, so to be honest, either you have to manage all of them for them to create value, or it's just dumb money coming in. So we prefer not to have dumb money. We prefer to leverage off investors, make them work very hard for their money, the same way they're making me work very hard for their money. So we like to keep the balance small. I think we've got four or five investors altogether. Um, another question. In the beginning, you mentioned how um, you're just, the hardest thing is to figure out your logistics, but you're a logistics company. And you're still trying to work it out, you said. You did say it. Yeah. You so said we're still trying to work it out. So what does that mean? Because you're a logistics company. So <laughs> everyone thinks logistics is, you know, take a parcel, move, put a parcel in a van and send it out. But I think there's a ton of nuances out there. There's a ton of things which you do to create a very defensive mode around it. Because anyone can do that. How do you do it efficiently? How do you create barriers to entry? How do you create bigger, more scalable, more flexible algorithms to cater to different types of movements? And we are figuring, finding out that you know, there's a new type of movement request, or you know, in desperation, we win a sale. We're like, okay, okay, you know, you, you want to deliver it that way, I'll do it for you. But we're like, shit, you know, how the hell is this to move? How is it supposed to flow through our system? How should our algorithms pick it up? And you know, there are new requests like this coming in every day, and our system always has constantly has to adapt. And sometimes you realize that, so for example, we used to pick all our algorithms into our system, and our head of our algorithms is somewhere here. So we really have to thank him for that. He's one of my good friends from a long time ago. So, a year ago, algorithms were baked into our code. This is current process, flows how it should work. As we learned more about the business, we learned that there are more types of movements which necessitated more types of algorithms. We came, it's very hard to keep baking these algorithms in the code. So what we did was we did a huge major refactor and we put all the algorithms out of the major algorithm engine, which we could then call as a microservice through standardized APIs. But this gave us so much more capabilities to keep building different types of order types and other movements which could move through different algorithms. And a year ago, I would never have thought about this. It just, it just, just, just delivered the damn parcel. Right? So, I don't think we know much about the entire locks industry. We keep looking, we keep trying to learn. So it sounds like you're a bit of a software company now. No, to be fair, I think we like to pride ourselves as software. Right? We, we pride ourselves on two main pillars. One is operational excellence, which means if I strip the tech away from everything you have, run the company. Make sure this guy listens to his superior. Make sure you have command and control over currently we have maybe about 15 or 20 hubs scattered around Southeast Asia. Make sure we have full command and control over all of them without technology. And the second is, now with technology, make sure you kick everyone's ass. Hello. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I'm launching my own startup soon, so I'll like insight on your early days. Um, profitability is always on your mind, right? And when you're starting out, um, where do you draw the line? Like when you, when I run out of money, <laughs> or you were highly profitable early on and you didn't have to worry about that? No, no, no. <laughs> definitely not highly profitable early on. Definitely not. Uh, I think be very careful. So these are my unit economics. It makes sense at a certain scale. When do I achieve this scale? How much will I lose at the point when I'll achieve skill to stop losing money? Am I bankrupt by then? If the answer is yes, either raise more money or go back and work somewhere else. Right? And if you do not know when you're going to achieve profitability, what skills required for you to tip that balance, then you can find it out, because you can find it out. Dig into your unit economics very carefully and ensure that this unit economics, or rather revenue component, is not based on a guesstimate on customers are willing to pay more once this happens. They are not. They will pay what they've always been paying. Um, kind of going along with that last question. Um, in the beginning of your career, did you ever face instances of self-doubt? And what actions did you take to overcome them? 
of course, I think many times you face self-doubt. To be honest, I think the, the period when I faced the most self-doubt was when me and my two co-founders, we sat on the floor of our small sorting facility, which was probably half the size of this office plus sort plus van dispatch. And we sat here. We're running a, I mean, if you're familiar with algorithms, we're running a sort process. We're running an N factorial search process physically. So we had 100 parcels. And the way to sort 100 parcels was to check against a manifest and see where it's going. So to do that, the first parcel of my hands, I had to search through 200 lines at least to find out where it's going. Then it gets shorter and shorter. So we were figuring out, like, you know, how the hell is it going to scale? If a 200 parcels, I take two hours. 400 parcels, it's not four hours. It's more than that. How am I ever going to scale a 1,000? We sat down like, shit, maybe what we thought about using a lot of algorithms in this market is not going to work because we just can't seem to figure a way out of that. Was, I, I mean, to me, I think I remember it the most vividly because it was like 5 a.m., just finished sorting. And we looked and we're like, there's 200 parcels. What the fuck are we doing? Like, we're screwed. There's no way you're going to scale like this. And I think we were quite sad. We looked at each other like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we set ourselves to start thinking. We started searching. We started thinking, you know, how else can we improve this process? I mean, thankfully, we managed to solve it. If not, we couldn't be where we are today. But I think you just need to be rational. Don't wallow in self-despair. Don't pat yourself on the shoulder and cry on your other shoulder. You know, be rational about it. Ask yourself if this is something which can be solved. And if you cannot, give up. You know, I'm not a big believer of hanging on to something all the, time, all the way because you only have one life. Don't waste it chasing something which doesn't make sense and bluffing yourself. Hi, uh, Chang Wen. It's a quick question. Uh, because I couldn't find out what is your, I'm just going to ask, oh, what is your valuation right now and what was it based on and are you guys profitable? I don't know if you can find it online, but I couldn't seem to uh, pick it up. Thanks. So um, my valuation right now is based on something lower than what I would have liked. It's based on thin air. And what's the last question again? In some markets. I don't know if you expected more. <laughs> So may I, 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 may I just repeat your question for my sake and yeah, sorry. So I think his question was, uh, why is it that we can differentiate? Because it's a competitive industry. How do we dig deep defensive modes around, around ourselves? And I think the second part to that would then be, how would I phrase it? One sentence. Okay. Okay, why, why rush into other countries when I claim that we haven't perfected in Singapore, right? So I guess to address the latter question would be, I think when you build a business, you don't just have one product you're selling. If one product was good enough, it could be a lot better. Are you going to wait till it's perfect before you go out? You could run out of funds before that. Or you could never learn how to make it better. So you understand what's the minimum viable product. I, mean, I don't really like that idea of MVP. I, mean, I, think, I think it's too minimum in, in their normal definition. Uh, I would call it a decent product. <laughs> a decent product is what you go to market with and try to get some market share, but you continually improve. And I think to a certain extent, a decent product is getting a parcel from you to someone else. And I think that we could do on a very efficient manner. But getting it to that guy in one hour in, in over 30 islands, I think that's something which we are constantly trying to figure out how to do the best. And that's why we still have a lot to learn. So uh, you know, in that aspect, yes. And why is it that we think that we are defensible? Because this business sucks. <laughs> it's tough. It's not just by algorithms. It's operationally heavy. It's a nightmare. It's 24 hours. Our, our hub runs 24 hours. I mean, people say they work 24 hours. They have three customer service many 24-hour desks. We have hundreds of people working in sort centers 24 hours. With driver management, with systems maintenance, it's a difficult business. And there's a lot of regulatory hurdles across over. And you need people who are willing to see this through, but yet are capable enough to ensure that it gets to the end point. So it's, it's a difficult business. It's a lot more thankless than you think it is. It's a lot shittier. It sounds glamorous. Sort of. Actually, I'm not sure what's so glamorous about driving a fucking van, but it's difficult. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, when, when we were hungry at 2 a.m. and the McDonald's is a kilometre away, and you're like, you know, should we order McDonald's? And you're like, dude, the delivery is $3, man. Just walk there. I'm like, yeah, let's save the $3. That's when I was like, fuck, you know, why did I leave my job, right? Because, you know, that would never have occurred to me previously. I think when the times are low, so I think it's when I was very broke, which made me think like going back. But when it was very tough, to be fair, I don't think we ever thought of going back because we valued it. Okay, it's, a, it's one thing you value the experience when you're trying to solve problems or you're really shagged out sorting puzzles in the middle of the night, figuring better ways to solve it. It's another experience when you're really flat out broke and that just sucks. There's nothing happy about that. I think we made a commitment to our initial investors that we see this through. And the business didn't seem like it would not work out. It just was extremely, extremely tiring. We had to give up a lot, all our social life. So we had made promises to other people. And as I said, right, we believe in living up to our promises. So that kept us going like, okay, you know, people trusted us. We will see this through. But the moment we realized that this is not a feasible business, we ended. So all along, thankfully, we, maybe we bluffed, deluded ourselves. But it always seemed like it's a feasible business, just extremely difficult. Uh, yep. Hi, Changwon. I understand that uh, you, I mean, when you charge a delivery, right, it's, it's based on the weight as well as the size. Uh, does it, number one, does it depend also on the distance, at least within Singapore? And the second question is, what if a customer he has uh, you know, many packages to send, let's say, to a particular building. You know, do you, and, and let's say he has uh, 30 deliveries all in the same building. Would you charge uh, you know, as if they are, they are 30 individual deliveries? Or you, you have a special price for that? Not entrapping me, right? Later, I say the wrong thing, then, hey, you said $5 to the whole building, no problem. No, no, so, see, this product market fit, right? What's the true cost of a parcel moving? It's definitely by distance, definitely. But why is it that in Singapore, most people do not charge by distance? Because it's a bitch to do so. Right? If you're a shipper, you want certainty that I ship anything in Singapore, just tell me it's five bucks, it's a lot easier. I do not want to care about variability in cost structures if it's within Singapore. You know, every customer, I run a different cost structure. It's a pain in the ass. And we recognize that. And we use a lot of large numbers to kind of aggregate it and say, look, this is the general number we, which will make us profitable. So that's why we don't use distances. The reason why it's by weight or size, perhaps, is because every van or motorbike has a limited amount of space. Space is the constraint in terms of how many you can fit into a van. So we charge you more if you take up more space because I can deliver to less places, and hence I need to maintain a certain standard revenue. Yeah, how about the, the second year, question? Right? It depends. We can do something special we want to. Most of the times, you don't care, we don't care, because it's just too much effort to go and figure out it's going to the same place. But if it's just one shipment sometimes, you know, you let us know and we'll send a special van down and it's cheaper than our normal rates. But it's true, if it's all 30 in one place, it, it is definitely lower cost structure for us. But, uh, and, and how about uh, when you compare like uh, what, what works in Singapore and then when you try to do it in Malaysia and, and Indonesia, uh, maybe you can give, do you have some examples where what work here may not work over there? So okay, the first example I can think of is the way you manage drivers. Motivation for drivers differ a lot from country to country. And I think that's where you have to really kind of understand what their mentality is like, what drives them and have remuneration schemes which is in line with what is what incentivizes them. So that's definitely one of the biggest changes. I mean, obviously, another is the speed of execution on both ends. You know, we have a contract to execute. Yeah, try executing it in Indonesia, see how long it takes. Yeah, I mean, I think very people differences. In terms of, the Jakarta is jam as shit. From the cross the road, it takes one hour, right? So you use different modes of transport in Jakarta, or you have different hub strategies. We have uh, like three hubs in Jakarta. Singapore, we have two. Although volumes are higher in Singapore, for example.
All right, all right. Thanks for the insightful talk. Really, in, um, really appreciate your candidness. Uh, so I'm running a software development company, and it's on. It's a B2B uh, company, kind of like yours. Just wanted to find out what it take in the beginning when you were like, you know, new in the field to get those big contracts. Like, any insights you can share with early stage startups to get the sales, especially in the early phase when you don't have that much funding. Okay, so the two of them are things I said previously, right? Hustle. And when you promise something, you deliver it. Do or die, deliver it. Right? Even if it costs you everything. Can you give give us an example of a hustle you did? Sorry. Give us an example of a hustle you did. Like your proudest, your proud hustle. Wrong gender, wrong gender, difficult. No, no, no. So that that, and, but the third one actually, I think, makes a lot of sense. Is always be receptive to feedback. Don't think that your product is the best. Listen to what they have to say, and think about it very carefully. Is, then what they want, does it make sense? And if you are SaaS, you're not SI, right? You, you're more like a SaaS company. Your products will be built for scale for many clients. You always have to find a very fine balance between deciding this is what a client wants and I give it to him, but you realize that these, are, these things which they want will differ across every single client. You are a software contractor, not a SaaS company. So you have to be very careful in finding the right balance between listening to feedback and building to scale. Get it wrong and you become software company, um, software contractor, do it right end. A month? Yeah, you have many ways to do it. Yep. Okay, uh, generally how do you build your mold? Essentially, let's say uh, a tech company, let's say Uber, for instance, decides to get into your space. How do you actually build the mode to prevent stuff like major competition coming in? Okay, so maybe the example of Uber. We yeah. don't run point-to-point -point services. We run, significant, we run proper sort algorithms, route algorithms on hub and spoke and multi-hub strategies, for example. So fundamentally, that's very different from Uber. Uber runs point-to-point. -point. You know, it's a different business altogether. But let's say someone with as much money, as much tech prowess, and as, as Uber comes in our space, to be honest, the first mode you dig is speed to market. So you're there first, you're at scale. How do you create a product better than mine without losing an insane amount of money and shift customers away? To be honest, it's not easy. As we said, it's not that hard to, it's not that hard to deliver a pass from point to point B through a hub and spoke methodology. But if I'm really doing that, what else can you offer which is better? Well, why would someone else give you that volume? It's, you know, it's not easy for them to win that volume first. And then, as you mentioned, we always identify white spaces. So we do things which may be less profitable or more difficult to ensure that we make customers happy. We pay a lot of value-added services, which is, again, replicable. But it takes time. And if we have all this, a new entrant comes in, what more are you going to offer? Why should someone else give it to you instead of us? You are in no way relatively not absolutely better than us. You might have more money, but it doesn't give you a better product. So it's hard for people to shift. And the moment they're integrated with us, it's very troublesome to break integration. Yes, you could go in and bargain on price. But if we are confident that we're extremely efficient, and we actually tell our clients how we run it, you know, we ask our clients, you know, if you want to push us on price, fine. Look at what this price is doing. Do you think he can, his cost is lower than that, or is higher than that? If his cost is higher than that, be my guest, join him. Next time you come back and rates are different. It you know, works a few ways. Uh, just a quick context. Uh, so my company, we sell storage racks where we deliver and we s do simple setup for our consumers. So right now, we are trying to expand more into our home consumer market. Uh, so a question to you will be that for Ninja Van, do you all, will you all be looking into premium services for organizations or companies that whereby on top of delivery, probably also do simple setup for that company itself? So this is a perfect example of logistics, right? More and more and more and more things out there. I think it comes to a certain point where we have to be very focused and say, this is the scale we want in the market to give us a certain kind of network which allows us to then decide the most profitable business angles going to. Either that or we say we're not at scale yet and we have to do this shit work to get to scale. That's a pretty issue. So I think it depends on market. In Singapore, we are at scale. So we pick any businesses out of our core e-commerce deliveries more carefully. So you know, if it's a big opportunity, we're always looking at it. 
if it's a smaller opportunity, the question is how much bandwidth does it take off for us to look into this? Because this will entail training drivers to set up racks on. What's the, what's, the, what's the value of this business? Is it 10 million a year? You know, then you like, no, let's look into it. But if it's 10 million and it seems like we're just a HR contractor, how do we scale this opportunity? How do we scale the capabilities we're building? And then we realize, no, it doesn't really scale. Okay, let's look at something else. So always open, but again, may not. I chose an industry which needs a lot less branding to a certain extent. A lot less for selling fashion. The product speaks for itself a lot more than the brand. I mean, honestly, a t-shirt is a t-shirt. I mean, it's all about the brand, right? But you can actually tell uh, your cost structure is actually very different when it comes to the delivery service. And this cost structure actually is transferred directly to our customer, not the end customer, but our shipper, because we give cost savings. So something which I'm more interested in, which is let's look at optimization, let's look at supply chain and so on, gets translated to something which is the most appreciated by the customer. Hi, I have two questions. First is that, you know, how, how do you acquire um, clients? I mean, like, especially for a new startup, right? How do, you, um, how do you build up your client base? That's my first question. And the second one is, how do you, how do you manage the competition with the um, sector incumbents like, you know, Singtel and other service, uh, delivery service providers? Thank you. How, how do I get clients? Uh, have enough friends, but not too many. So you know which friends you can knock on to ask for help. I think that's important, right? Like, don't be a social butterfly and just flit everywhere. No one really respects you or gives two shits about you. Right. But, but they, they know that when you knock on their door, they're willing to talk to you. I think yeah, that's but, but how about, say, when you, I mean, I, I see on your website that you have entered into several markets. I mean, like, in these markets, do you have friends everywhere or? <laughs> Make friends. I see. Um, Selectively. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very good to know. But how about the competition part then? Well, I think the competition exists and they are strong. This is not a monopolistic market. It's not a fragmented market because you don't get the economies of scale there. But neither is this a monopolistic market because most merchants or most e-commerce players or most shippers get a bit worried when there's only one dominant player in the market because he sets a price. So many times they're willing to support the second and third guy out there. So it, the market generally is sufficient for three big players. So this gives us some breathing space because what we've seen in the region is that in every country you have at most one or two big players and hopefully we can be that third, hopefully. Oh, hi. I have a question. So when you hire people, what are the kind of qualities they look out for? I think we, we look out for self-awareness. And I think that's quite evident sometimes. Uh, self-awareness is very important because no one comes perfect. Right? Everyone has a lot of room for improvement. But if you're not self-aware, you don't know that you have to improve and you won't improve and that's a big problem. I mean, of course, the plus is like, you know, nice to talk to, nice to look at, no, 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 not nice to look at, nice to talk to, uh, not stupid, you know, these are nice to have, right? I mean, your basic assumption is that most people are not too stupid, no, too ugly, you know. But as I said, everyone can improve and no one comes perfect. And the moment we find that someone doesn't have good self-awareness, he stops improving. And that's where you face a lot of problems down the road. Okay, hi. So one evening, a ninja guy showed up on my door with a package, and I really liked that. So could you share a little bit about the name behind the company and how you thought of that? Oh, thanks. Thanks for the compliment. Seldom hear it. <laughs> Thankless job, right? Ninja Van. No, I think we were thinking of really stupid names before this. Like my, my, my co-founder's name is Borsian, so we call him Bobo the dog, right? So it's like Bobo, Bobo, like why do you call the company Bobo the postman? He's like, fuck you, dude, you call it Bobo the postman, I'm not working in this company. I'm, fuck you, I'm not going to call the company by me and make it sound like I'm a dog, because the mascot was a dog and it was him. He got pissed off, man, so that, that was scrapped. That was the first name. I liked it though, but well. <laughs> then we came up with like very boring logistics names, which we looked at and like, mm. at the end of the day, I don't think, our vision is necessarily to be only e-commerce. We'll do all kinds of transport. 
but the entry point is e-commerce, right? That's the only thing which has really changed in the last five years, and has given us, given us an entry into this logistical space. Without e-commerce, I don't think we differentiate from anyone else that much. So we wouldn't have even gotten the scale level we need. So we can let's get something which actually touches consumers, and it's a bit interesting, it's a bit more memorable. To be fair, we didn't think so much if Ninja would be construed differently in other countries. But somehow it lucked out, you know, it isn't terrible. It isn't like slang for something bad in other countries. So I think we're just throwing names around. And in the army, I think in Taiwan, if you're in Taiwan, a ninja van is a van which finds you in the mountains when you're cold, hungry, and unhappy. And it gives you food and makes you happy. So to us, it's like, yeah, why not? It sounds cute. Ninja van's a van, right? It delivers shit. And you know, we're like, no, let's deliver things anytime, anywhere. And a ninja van in Taiwan really does that. Just that if you get caught by a commander, you probably go to DB, but... Um, hi. Here, Chang Wen, on your left. Hi. Um, can I ask a bit more about um, what kind of plans you have to further expand in Southeast Asia or Asia? And um, what kind of problems you see? Maybe not just Asia, like world domination. Like, uh, what, what kind of uh, rollout plans do you have? No, no, to be realistic, Southeast Asia, okay? Southeast Asia. So I think we are currently opening Thailand and Philippines. I see a sad life in front of me stuck on planes. But interestingly, I think a very big problem you have in all these markets is we were quite lucky to get decent press in Singapore. And as a Singaporean company, people kind of laud you a little more. The moment you're overseas, you're always an overseas company coming in. You're that little bitch trying to steal my market. And that's never good for us. We try to localize it as much as we can, but it's not easy. So finding the head is a challenge in itself, senior management. And as I said, senior management is always a bit easier. Then the middle management problem comes in. Because you realize that in this, in this industry, it's not a five-man team anymore. In any country at scale, you're looking at 1,000, 2,000 people. And out of these 2,000 people, you need a ton of middle management. And then you have to find that middle management. And it's not easy. Because what you see in Malaysia, in Indonesia, is that What's a good middle manager? Someone who's decently well-educated, good, hungry, willing to learn, willing to spend three years learning as much, as much experience as possible. But you realize that the educated class there, many of them, come from wealthy families with family businesses. They're not going to work for someone else because the income disparity between a working class and a business owner is huge. You pay market wage. For example, in Malaysia, you pay market wage, you're paying 3,000 doing it. A cup of coffee costs 10 ringgit. Dollar to dollar compared back is extremely expensive for them. Most of them find it really hard to take account of salary cuts, or to take account of salary. So the better educated ones all go do something else. They rather open their own satay store than to go work for someone else. And that's the sad fact of other countries. In Singapore, it's a lot easier. So you have an acute shortage of middle managers, or you have to overhire someone into a position which he is too good for. Then in two years, you see a very big churn and a very big problem. Great. Um, back to the last question. Do you see um, the company growing beyond last mile, but going into more um, of what Flipsport is doing, into the international shipping, container, space, etc.? Maybe not international shipping, but there's a lot of space for domestic logistical movements. International shipping, it's too far. And that one, we don't know too much. But I think domestic is something we know better. It may not always be express parcels, maybe a lot more than that. Great. So thanks, Changwen, for joining us this evening. Um, please stick around for drinks and refreshments, food of all sorts. Um, and Changwen will be around with some questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks.